When I was a sophomore in high school, sitting in my American history class, we were learning about the Gilded Age. The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and we eventually landed on the topic of the muckrakers. Nellie Bly was one of the focuses. Bly, a perfectly sane woman, in 1887 had a doctor declare her insane in order to go undercover at a New York insane asylum. This operation exposed the grim horror and abuses on Blackwell Island and helped pave the way for female muckrakers and journalists in decades to come. Though during that same unit, we also discussed the work of Upton Sinclair and his dive into Chicago's meatpacking plants. The setup was pretty much the same as Bly's. Sinclair went undercover under false pretense, and when he got out, he wrote the expose The Jungle in 1906 on the horrid conditions that led to delivering bad meat to vulnerable families across America. Sinclair is bucketed with Bly as a muckraker, someone doing in-depth investigations and exposing industry bad practices to the public. And that is by and large a fair characterization on what Sinclair's experience was writing The Jungle. He did go undercover in Chicago meatpacking plants, and he did write about the abuses that went on there. So what's my beef here? Hey, where's the beef? I don't think there's a beef. So we're doing something a little different tonight. I'm going to talk about something that has always bothered me. And while I do that, I'm going to drink whiskey. Tonight, I'm drinking Elijah Craig's Small Batch because Heaven Hill is one of the last family-owned major distilleries in the world. And editor's note, while I was writing this, I discovered that Heaven Hill was just ending a six week long strike over everything from fair scheduling of their workers to simply increasing pay. While it's fantastic to hear that the strike has ended and I'd encourage everyone to go out and grab a bottle of this lower end whiskey, it still does worry that they needed to strike at all. While I raise a bit of an eyebrow to that, I'll also raise a glass, because here we go. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle was published in 1906, and due to public interest and outcry, within six months, both the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act were passed under federal law. Think about that. It's an insanely short amount of time. This book came out became immensely popular amongst the American people, and all of a sudden our politicians were reacting on a national scale. This is a far cry from the current American political state where the variable of public support has a near zero impact of legislation passing. The question that results from this is simply, were the early 1900s simply a different time? Did politicians actually give a shit about what the public thought? My thoughts on this may be cynical, my answer's no. But let's put a pin in that for a moment. The Jungle was not about the horrid practices of packing meat in these plants. The Jungle is over 400 pages with only a portion of the book describing these conditions. Even at that, the major focus of these passages is on working conditions, not so much the product that left the factory. For example, Men who worked in tank rooms full of steam, and in some of which there were open vats near the level of the floor. Their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats, and when they were fished out, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone out to the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. I love this line due to the use of the word peculiar. It was peculiar trouble, those guys carelessly falling into vats, dying and whatnot. That description, while visceral and unnerving, didn't seem to do much in terms of describing the product at hand. The idea of having churned up ligaments of a poor sap in your lard isn't something I'd look forward to, but the heart of that passage focused far more on the dismissal of the employees' lives. Sure, I may have had some human pieces in my lard, but a man lost his life and no one seems to care. Think about what America was like in the early 1900s. 
it was the Gilded Age, gilded being the shiny golden crust of upper-class American society designed to hide the shanties underneath that the working class were left to rot in. Got a good visual? By the time the 1900s rolled in, the wealthiest 4,000 families had as much wealth as the other 11.6 million families combined. Also keep in mind that in 1905, halfway across the world was the first Russian Revolution, which eventually led to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. It was the first major incident in Russia that enabled Bolshevism to take hold as a distinct political movement. Lenin, the head of the Bolsheviks, referred to 1905's revolution as the Great Dress Rehearsal. And without it, the victory of the October Revolution in 1917 would have been impossible. And it was in Sinclair's upbringing that he was able to see firsthand both sides of this wealth coin. Prior to Sinclair's birth, his family had been extremely rich, but due to complications with the Civil War, labor disruptions, and an extended agricultural depression, the money dried up. His home life was of a lower working class American family. His father became a liquor salesman whose alcoholism became a staple memory of Sinclair's childhood. And while his family was lucky to have a stable roof over their heads, Sinclair would sleep either on sofas or in his parents' bed most nights. On his mother's side of the family, his grandparents were able to hold on to their wealth and were extremely affluent. This allowed Sinclair a taste of the upper classes living. His sister went on to marry a millionaire, for example. These interactions allowed him to see beyond his own situation and break out of the mindset of his class bubble. This deep understanding of how the other half lived was extremely influential in writing The Jungle. Sinclair's childhood was a major factor in his rise as a socialist thinker. But in order to see these themes in action, we need to actually dive into the novel itself. Are you ready? The novel opens during the marriage between two Lithuanian immigrants, Ona Lukasiate and our main character, Jurgis Rutkus. During the celebration, the book lays out the first class hierarchy of the novel, and more importantly, the powerlessness of the working class immigrant. The saloon keeper or bartender for the wedding is someone that during these times was often known to cheat the families on their beer and liquor tab. What they do is they would claim that guests consumed far more than in actuality, or they just served swill compared to the higher quality offerings the family actually paid for. But immigrants quickly learned to not agitate these saloon keepers and to simply pay them what they asked. You might complain, but you would get nothing for your pains but a ruined evening. While, as for going to the law about it, you might as well go to heaven at once. The saloon keeper stood in with all the big politics men in the district, and when you had once found out what it meant to get in trouble with such people, you would know enough to pay what you were told to pay and shut up. So Jurgis had to pay. And in order to pay this tab, Jurgis promises his wife he'll work harder and earn the money needed. As Jurgis is an employed man, he's able to do just that, just as long as he's allowed to follow the strict rules of his job. If one of them be a minute late, he will be docked an hour's pay. And if he be many minutes late, he will be apt to find his brass checked turned to the wall, which will send him out to join the hungry mob that waits every morning at the gates of the packing houses from six o'clock until nearly half past eight. Work or starve were the options during this time. But Jurgis, being an upstanding American immigrant, was going to work. The only thing it takes to live the American dream is a little hard work, right? Yeah, all right, let's get into this, boys. Jurgis's job, of course, was in one of Chicago's meatpacking plants. By chapter three, the stories of the plant begin, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of terrible imagery in these pages, from the yards with animals packed together to the unsanitary conditions throughout the factory. But the main focus hones in on both human and animal mistreatment. But this is Jurgis we're talking about. And besides all that, he's encouraged by his salary and his wife. Also that Ona's cousin Marija has a job painting can labels for $2 a day. 
and neither Ona nor Jurgis's children need to work. Jurgis and his extended family are able to purchase a home with $300 down and monthly payments of only $12. Cause like capitalism in America, all Jurgis has to do is work hard and success will follow. But unfortunately there's an indication that something malicious is going on in the sale of the house because the contract actually states that the sale, it's just a rental. The family quickly learns that the house is in terrible condition and the $12 a month, psych, it's actually $20. And a single missed payment would result in eviction and the four families that previously owned the home all missed that single payment and were thrown out. And that fear of eviction is almost immediately realized amongst the family. Once the horrid, unsanitary working conditions in the meat packing plant begin to make Jurgis sick, along with the lack of heat in the winter, Marija's canning factory is shut down and Jurgis's hours get cut back. The family gets very quickly on that brink. But there is a bright spot because this is what leads Jurgis's fight for unionization. That was the solution he saw as viable. Overall, while the first half of the book in large part focuses on the meatpacking plants, it's not to show the horrific conditions that caused bad meat to be shipped around America. It was to establish the life of a lower working class American. How impossible it was to get by as everything was stacked against you. There's an accusation against society here, but also of capitalism undermining what was supposed to be the American dream. Jurgis slowly becomes resigned to the feudal reality and falls into alcoholism. His wife passes away and then his son accidentally drowns. His American dream is broken and as a broken man, he goes to the nearest railway car and rides it into the country. It's here where traveling from farm to farm, he's frequently fortunate enough to find hot meals and a barn to sleep in in exchange for work. Jurgis states that he feels like his own master again. This section of the book is Jurgis' first break from capitalism, his first ounce of happiness since the wedding at the start of the novel, and most importantly, he can see that his hard work actually has results. Unfortunately, due to the lack of farm work in the winter, Jurgis is forced to return to Chicago and again works before breaking his arm, losing his job. Eventually finding work as a hog trimmer, but right before a union organized strike breaks out and he again loses his job. This event causes him to lose much of his faith in unionization as being the way out. Soon Jurgis discovers that Marija has given into the idea of prostitution and became addicted to morphine. At this point, Jurgis goes looking for answers. He finds a gathering of socialists and begins to educate himself. The novel ends here with the spirited gathering of socialists, which acts as Sinclair's rather on the nose call to action for the reader. And we shall organize them. We shall drill them. We shall marshal them for victory. We shall bear down the opposition. We shall sweep if before us. And Chicago will be ours. Chicago will be ours. Chicago will be ours. The Jungle was originally published in 1905 in a series of publications in the magazine Unappeal to Reason, which was a socialist magazine. The Jungle gained a significant popularity, but was still rejected by five publishers just months later. The publisher Doubleday came aboard, and by the end of February of 1906, 5,000 copies were published under the imprint of The Jungle Publishing Company, with the Socialist Party's symbol embossed on the cover. Upton Sinclair was a socialist his entire life. He was deeply influenced by the ideas of, it was some mid 1800s philosopher with his writings on the inequalities of economic classes. Who's that Pokemon? It's Pikachu! It's the fairy! Fuck! Yeah, this philosopher was Karl Marx. The entirety of the jungle was an attempt at starting an economic uprising in America. In talking about the novel, Sinclair quipped, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. But here's the question that I pose. Did he actually hit the public's stomach? Now, muckraking journalists for years 
had attempted to bring the extreme concerns of bad meat to the public's attention, but nothing had ever stuck prior. And yet within four months of The Jungle being published by Doubleday, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed through Congress. Seven days later, the Federal Meat Inspection Act was also passed. Why was the legislation focused on meat when the struggles that Sinclair describes in the novel were painfully accurate to the working class American condition? There was a massive subset of Americans that saw themselves in Jurgis's shoes, just wanting to work hard and live a decent life, and yet failing to do so. One of Sinclair's most famous quotes approaches the reason. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. The rich and powerful in the country saw a book that was becoming extremely powerful as it edged closer to the idea that the country needed an economic overhaul. President Theodore Roosevelt spoke of Sinclair as a crackpot due to the writer's socialist leanings. In writing to journalist William Allen White, Roosevelt said, I have an utter contempt for him. He is hysterical, unbalanced, and untruthful. Three-fourths of the things he said were absolute falsehoods. For some of the remainder, there was only a basis of truth. And what was the part that had the basis in truth? After reading The Jungle for himself, Roosevelt did agree with some of Sinclair's intended conclusions, writing, Radical action must be taken to do away with the efforts of arrogant and selfish greed on the part of the capitalist. But then again, Roosevelt's job depended upon him not understanding this, or at least publicly so, because the action he took was to send labor commissioner and social worker Charles P. Neal to Chicago to investigate these meatpacking plants. Neal even testified before Congress but chose to focus on the allegations on the public's stomach and not the overall structural critique that Sinclair intended to bring into the zeitgeist. In essence, Sinclair intended to start a conversation in America, a conversation about socialism. He wanted something similar to the first Russian revolution. He didn't think labor laws, regulations, or unions would do any good. And when he finally reached an audience willing to listen to him and to listen to his cause, the machine kicked in. Politicians and federal officials stepped up to ensure Sinclair's actual message wasn't heard. Instead, they threw out a red herring, forcing the American taxpayers an estimated $30 million per year for inspections and then packed it in. Everything else that this book was actually about was quietly wept under the rug. All right, so I think that's it for our first ever whiskey talk. This has been really fun. Uh, I hope to do this more with different topics, subjects. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. So, um, cheers.